while his doctor of engineering was awarded from the same university in 1997. Professor Tanaka had experience as research associate in Department of Chemistry, University of Wisconsin Medicine in the US from 1997 to 1999. After that, he worked at Department of Applied Chemistry, Kyushu University until now. And since 2019, Professor Tanaka is appointed as Director of Center for Polymer Interface and Molecular Addition Science, Kyushu University. Professor Keiji Tanaka specialized in physical properties of polymers and has studied the structure and physical properties of polymers at various interfaces with solids and liquids. And according to Scopus, Professor Tanaka has a H index of 38 with 306 articles and 5,000 of citations. In addition to basic research, he has conducted trans, trans, uh, slash, translate, translate, translational research that is uh, to translate the finding observed in a laboratory to manufacturing by collaborating with several private companies with the aim of developing materials and devices as well as giving back to society. So, ladies and gentlemen, Please join me in welcoming Professor Keji Tanaka. Professor Tanaka, the time is yours. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And my name is Keji Tanaka from Kyushu University. And today I'm going to the talk about um, structure and dynamics of polymers at the yeah, solid interface, as uh, he kindly introduced. And let me share my slides. Can I say it? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. yes. Right. Great. All right, so let me start with um, this slide. And that's what take a look at this cartoon showing what I'm talking about. This is um, the interface of polymers with um, any kinds of uh, different phases. And I start to change the title of my talk from uh, what he introduced, but uh, the currently they have um, uh, this title and I have three keywords. One of them is just dynamics. And uh, the second one is the polymer change. And the last one is the interface. And uh, I, I suppose that most of you uh, major uh, base chemistry, but what I'm doing is uh, try to a kind of applied chemistry which is part of the chemistry. So I'm not sure whether you are familiar with this kind of stuff or not, but let me try to explain um, as, as uh, reasonable as possible. So well, let me go to uh, the image of polymer chain. And uh, this is um, direct observation of a single polymer chain. And uh, take a look at this atomic force microscopic image showing a single polymer chain. And the uh, polymer was uh, polymer so called PMMA. And the molecular weight is about, um, this is a number of its molecular weight. It's about uh, 300,000. And the molecular strong temperature of this PMMA was uh, 403 K by using differential scan parametry, so called DSC. And uh, the substrate was mica. And we prepare a dilute solution of PMMA into a uh, cloth form. And then we spin carpet that solution onto this micro, and then the substrate was dry. And then we applied atomic force McCarthy. And then actually it takes time to look for single chains, but uh, eventually we made it. And uh, you see, this is the polymer chain. And then we elevated the temperature from uh, room temperature to 330 K, and then this shape became clearer. And then we went to further, like 328 K, and uh, this image was um, actually uh, less clear. And why is that? Because actually, with increased temperature, motion, um, I mean, Broken motion became 
became activated. That is why we could see this kind of a difference. But from here to here, actually conformation was changed from loop conformation to uh, actually train conformation. I'm gonna show you the cartoon later on, but we just look at the cross-sectional area of this single chain. See here, this is at room temperature, but with increased temperature, this cross-sectional area is gonna decrease. And with increased temperature, this is gonna be faster decreased. Then actually what is going on with this transition is like this. And at the beginning, we have this kind of loop conformation, but eventually this is gonna be collapse like this. Then we see this kind of uh, clear shape. And now that we also take a look at this part and with increased temperature, this part actually moves like this. And this part further moves like this. So what I can say from these images is that we are directly able to see the movement of a single polymer chain. That's what I'm saying. So um, then let me explain where uh, I'm here, right? This is the geography of Japan. The Japan is composed of four main islands. One of them is the Hokkaido, and this is the Honshu, and this is Skoko Island, this is the Kyushu Island. We are coming from here. And uh, this is the center of Japan. And uh, I suppose that you know where Tokyo is. And uh, if we take a flight from Tokyo to Skoko, it takes just one and a half hours. And um, from here to your country, probably it takes uh, hopefully five hours or six hours or something. So um, this is a snapshot of our campus. And our campus is surrounded by sea. And uh, here's a uh, mountain. And um, we are pretty much isolated from the city, meaning that the uh, students are able to concentrate on studying and uh, doing some experiments. That's good for professors, but not necessarily good for students, probably. They don't have a uh, good occasion to play around. So um, this is um, actually central topics of my research group. And uh, we have been, as I told you, working in polymer interfaces, and uh, we are going to polymer synthesis. And then once we have uh, fancy polymers, based on controlled radical polymerization and uh, and polymerization as well. We go to uh, structure and dynamic polymers using uh, synchrotron radiation and neutrons and lasers and scan force microscopy and so forth. Then we go to uh, some applications like um, polymer devices, like solar cells and the polymer gels and um, biomaterials as well, like cellar scaffolds and so forth. So uh, this stuff, let me uh, concentrate on looking at this part. So, um, but before going to the detail, let me show you what's going with the other research topics. This is uh, polymer design, I mean, working on uh, uh, polymer stations. And um, this is actually, um, Typical glass polymers like polymer system ductwright, and uh, this is water. And uh, we put this kind of polyotexan structure into a uh, glass polymer surface. Then, actually, this surface has uh, some sort of functions to avoid the attachment of uh, proteins and cells and so forth onto this surface. And now, that about also, we go to um, like uh, 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 I, I forgot the name of that. Uh, 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 this is um, uh, hydrogen pass and uh, napium. Uh, I'm sorry, I eventually remembered napium. And uh, we control the interface structure of napium films onto solid substrate. And once from chains are aligned, at the interface with uh, uh, electrode, then actually the performance of napium is to be drastically improved. And we also go to uh, spur uh, molecular hydrogel 
this is a gelator. And then we measured electrical properties of this kind of gel. And see here, we put a tiny percent particles. The size of this particle is about, let's say, 100 nanometers. Then we are able to extract their physical properties, like electrical properties. I mean, viscosity around here. I mean, this is kind of a local viscosity. But the um, resolution of that technique is, but as I told you, uh, less than one micrometer. We are going to smaller and smaller. Then we go to um, these uh, quantum dots. The yeah, diameter of a quantum dot is about seven nanometers. Then probably you see this motion. And uh, then we are able to extract the viscosity, I mean, local viscosity of this um, gelator solution. And the resolution is about, let's say, less than 10 nanometers. So uh, we are combining what we got on the base of this particle tracking experiment with scattering experiment using uh, synchrotron radiation and so forth. So um, okay, let me skip this. Then here is uh, my agenda today. First of all, I'm going to briefly browse what's the background of our research, and then go to uh, local conformation parameters, and then we go to the summary relaxation of those chains at the such substrate. And then we go to uh, detailed analysis of those molecular motion and finally conclude my talk. So uh, this is a um, very big basic question. What is a solid? And look at this phase diagram and uh, the x-axis given by the temperature and the ordinary signs for ones to be all our body. And first of all, why don't we think about where we are and we are here. And then with decreasing temperature, this entropy of volume decreases like this. And at a given temperature, this can be suddenly developed if the material can be crystallized. Then with decreasing temperature, this goes down like this. However, if your materials could not be crystallized, in that case, this volume or entropy just keeps decreasing like this and eventually lost the movement, but without the alignment of molecules. In that case, what we call this material is just glass or super cool liquids and so forth. And this is actually liquid on the base of a physical chemistry. Remember that um, to be solid, according to physical chemistry, the material must go through this thermodynamic phase transition. However, glass has not experienced this pathway. So in that case, this should be a liquid, but that is just a frozen liquid. Frozen liquid doesn't necessarily mean solid. However, if you have a solid material or a peat bottle or somehow, you may think that, okay, that is uh, solid, right? That is not like liquid. However, according to uh, physical chemistry, as I told you, that is a liquid. So uh, we should have a different definition of solid. So here is a very basic definition of solid based on rheology. And tau is a relaxation time for molecules, and this small t is the observation time. If this number is going to be extremely larger than just a unity, in that case, you are able to say that, OK, that material is a solid, because that move, and at least doesn't look like moved, right? So this is the definition. That is why knowing the tau is very important, right? If you have a material in bulk, in that case, tau is always fixed. However, if you take a look at 
the interface tau can be moved, I mean changed. That is why I'm trying to explain what is tau and what is the definition of a solid. And as I told you, tau is actually the ratio between viscosity and modulus. And this is kind of a um, viscous part. And uh, this is the elastic part. And this ratio is the relaxation time. And tau is actually the indicator of how fast molecules could move. So um, then let me show you how the interface with the solid substrate is important. And take a look at this cartoon showing our sample. And uh, this is a thin film of just polystyrene. And I suppose that you are familiar with polystyrene. This is a simple, I mean, typical glass polymer at room temperature. And chemical structure of polystyrene is like this. And the substrate is a silicon wafer with the native oxide layer. All right, nothing special. And then we have prepared a thin film with this polystyrene on this silicon wafer using a spin cutting technique. I mean, we first made a solution of polystyrene into a toluene, and then substrate is going to be rotated, and we put a droplet of polymer solution on it and then dry. Then eventually you can prepare thin films. And this is how we are able to determine the restoration temperature of this thin film. Right? And we can measure the thickness by using layometer, uh, I'm sorry, uh, ellipsometer or X-ray reflectivity. And see, with increasing temperature, thickness is going to be increased as well. And why I say is because we have to think about some expansion. But with increased temperature and then leach a given temperature, I mean, a special temperature, then this slope is going to change because we could leach grassland temperature. So measuring temperature dependence of thickness, we are able to determine the grassland temperature of this kind of thing. And that's what I'm talking about. Then look at this figure. This is a thickness dependence of grassland temperature, right? And you see that with decreasing thickness, Tg goes down like this. And why is that? See here, this is a geometry of a sample. As I told you, at the surface, actually, molecular motion, I mean, chain movement is pretty much enhanced in comparison with that in the internal region of the film. Why is that? It's because polymer chains are not surrounded by other chains because it's just surface, right? So with decreasing its thickness, the ratio of surface area to the total bottom is going to be extremely increased. That is why we could see this kind of behavior. But the point here is that we have a different parameter, H, and see here, H is the thickness of this oxide layer. And if this age is going to be changed, then thickness dependence of grassland temperature is going to be changed as well. So what this means that this solid interface is also very important to understand the physical properties of this kind of polymer thing. That's what I'm talking about. And why is that? Because we have some dynamics. And I suppose that you have studied surface chemistry. In that case, you know what van der Waals interaction, long range interaction. So if we think about the interfacial potential on the basis of van der Waals interaction, then we are able to explain this kind of behavior. But um, I didn't have enough time to explain all of them. So let me skip this part and just trust me and we can explain that behavior. But point here is that 
this interface is also important. So um, you produce lots of labor materials in a country. And once people want to use labor particles, usually we put some sort of fillers, I mean, reinforcing materials. So once we put feeder into labors, the mechanical properties is going to be very much enhanced, improved. Why is that? Because we have a bunch of this solid interface. That's the important point, and that's what I'd like to share with you today. So um, then we're going to really take a look at the polymer structure at the solid interface. How we can do that is to use some frequency generation of spectroscopy. This is um, like a vibrational spectroscopy, infrared spectroscopy. This is almost the same as uh, IR. But what's the difference between conventional IR and SFG is the depth resolution. And in case of SFG, the depth resolution is better than one nanometer. It's completely molecular level. And actually, here is the principle, but I'm sure that chemistry people doesn't like equations. So let me skip this part. But the point here is that, as I told you, this technique is really interfacial sensitive. And one more point we have. Actually, this is good technique, but to get a sensitive signal, a functional group, which we have been looking at, must be oriented at the interface. That's principle. So let me go to a local conformation polymer at the solid substrate. And here's what we get by SFG. And uh, we've been still looking at for size. And uh, the substrate is quartz. And chemical structure of quartz is same as the uh, oxygen layer of silicon vapor. So this result can be directly compared with what I have shown you before. And actually, we have two methods to prepare films of polymers on such substrate. One of them is as I told you, spin cutting method. And another, oops, excuse me. Another is, um, I couldn't, I couldn't use it. Um, doesn't work, I'm sorry. So let me go. Oops. Right. Um, another is a solvent cutting method. And Actually, this polytime film was sandwiched between two clothes substrates. So we have only the interface of polystyrene with clothes. And then we have been looking at CH vibration. I mean, just polystyrene information. And you see that this shape is not the same as this one. So what does it mean is that polystyrene has completely different conformation with cold substrate if we apply two different methods. So in case of spin cutting method, we have a peak here from 3,000 up to 3,100 centimeter inverse. Actually, this is the information for phenyl groups. And as I told you, in case of SFG, to get signals, functional groups must be oriented at the interface. So this means that in case of spin cutting method, phenyl groups are aligned, I mean, oriented at such subject. But that is not the case for a certain cast method. So imagine the following. In case of spin cutting method, substrate is going to be rotated. So polymer solutions must feel 
centrifugal force. So in that case, from the chains must be aligned in the plane. And phenocyte groups are directly attached to polymer chains. So as I told you, polymer chains are aligned in plane. That is why we could see this kind of orientation of phenyl groups, side chains at the interface. So um, then, all right, that'd be fine. We have applied two different techniques to prepare for same things on the substrate. So um, then structure a part of me that substrate is going to be changed. Okay, that makes sense. So then you may want to anneal those samples at the temperature being higher than the bulk grassland temperature. And as a storage, we have been using for starting with bulk grassland temperature of 100 degrees Celsius. I mean, 373K. So um, then we anneal these samples right at 120 degrees Celsius for 24 hours and 150 degrees Celsius for three hours and 180 degrees Celsius, which is higher than bulk heat by 80 degrees Celsius for three hours. But these peaks could not disappeared. But that means that from chains at the substrate could not be relaxed. So imagine the following. You have polymers. And if those polymer chains attached to the solid substrate, then polymer chains could not be moved. That's what I'm talking about. That is why composite materials could play an important role for many industries. But this peak, right, 150 degrees Celsius, 423 Kelvin. And as I told you, this annual time was three hours. But if we anneal longer, like 144 hours, that peak disappeared or at least it became smaller. Why is that? Because polymer chains could relax even at solid substrate. So um, it's possible to relax polymer chains even at the solid substrate, but it's just slow and it takes time. That's what I'm talking about. So um, then actually, Grass strength temperature of polymers at the solid substrate must be very high. So we measure grass strength temperature of polystyrene as a function of distance. And actually, this is the analytical depth. We have used fluorescence technique. And this data corresponds to the interface between polymer. And this is polymer side. And Go to this way, it's a um, uh, substrate side. Okay, going to this way, as I told you, it's in bulk. So you see that getting closer to the interface, TG is going to be very higher. So um, for starting, has bulk TG of 100 degrees Celsius, 373 K, but getting closer to the interface, it will be extremely higher. So, um, but the problem here is that this X axis is not in real depth. This is analytical depth. So we have to convert this data into uh, real depth. So see here, this is actual real depth and this is TG elevation. And this epsilon means the interaction between polymers and the third substrate. And in case of porcelain, this Number is about one to two, and the TG elevation is very high. And um, so this is completely good accordance with what I have been showing you before, like temperature dependence of um, conformation or relaxation at the substrate. So um, 
actually, um, then let me go to um, for the ice cream. And I, I suppose that, yeah, how many words for the ice cream? This is a typical laboratory polymer. And um, this is the main ingredient of natural lava. But actually, we have synthesized for the ice cream by another polymerization. So uh, here is the chemical structure of sample for ice cream on a uh, substrate. Again, we have applied some of the intention spectroscopy to take a look at the conformation of the ice cream on the substrate. So again, we have applied two different techniques. One of them is serving casting method, and another is uh, spin cutting method with different spinning blades from 2,000 up to 5,000 uh, RPM. And here's what we got by NCG. And you see that the shape of number one, uh, I'm sorry, number five, is totally different from number one. So uh, it's clear that for ice cream prepared by solvent casting method, has a different conformation on the solid substrate by a spinning, spin cutting method with the rotation speed of 5,000 RPM. And again, imagine that the substrate is going to be rotated. So for the aspirin, must be felt centrifugal force on the solid substrate and polymer chains are aligned. Then structure by spin coating is totally different from that by uh, sodium casting method. And actually, um, on the basis of this spectra, we are able to calculate the tilt angle of this missile group from normal direction to the sub, uh, substrate. So you see that with increasing centrifugal force, actually, this is proportional to a uh, spinning rate, the tilt angle of missile group is going to be changed as well. So once we put strong shear, then polymer chains were more aligned at the solid substrate. So um, this is again AFM image, but this case, the sample was DNA. So we directly look at the uh, conformation of DNA on the substrate. And this was obtained from a uh, conventional uh, drop cast method. But once we prepared the same sample by using solvent cast uh, and solid spin cutting method, then you see that chain are elongated like this. So uh, again, you see that polymer chain could be easily aligned once you put shear force or other forces. Then you can control the structure of partners on. Uh, fila surface and of course physical properties of change at the substrate you can change as well and eventually the bulk mechanical properties of polymers I mean polymer composites will be also changed so um actually we can go to a uh, further um, detail analysis of interfacial dynamics and uh, this is uh, styrene butyrate and rubber, which is the main ingredient of tire material. You know tire, as we all mix with uh, carbon blocks. And then actually um, you can get on cars or motorbikes and so forth. And we've been through looking at the structure of SBR on uh, silica uh, particles and so forth. 
So we again applied some frequency generation spectroscopy, and we take a look at the relaxation behavior of polymer chains by using some frequency generation spectroscopy, and we applied um, fundamental polymer analysis using KW relaxation and uh, Bogeo culture equation and so forth. Then we are able to determine the Grassland temperature polymer directly attached to uh, solid materials. So this is just an example. And SPR voltage by DSC was uh, 204K, but SBR chains on quartz, the TG is be extremely high, approximately 200 Kelvin higher than the bulk part. So um, then actually this is gonna be strongly, um, I mean, impact on bulk mechanical properties like uh, stretch modulus. Uh, this is the uh, complex modulus and so forth. But I ran out of time, so let me go through this part. And uh, this is the uh, NBR case, acro nitro butane level, and uh, we can we can conclude the same thing. And uh, this is the relaxation behavior. And uh, let me explain one more thing. This is actually a uh, relaxation time of glass transition. And actually, more concretely, this is a uh, segmental motion, and uh, this x-axis is the inverse of temperature. This is like the Allen's plot. And going to this way, temperature is to be higher. And uh, here is bulk TG. And this is a bulk behavior. Number one is bulk behavior. And number two is the inter interfacial behavior with a thickness of 15 nanometers, 15 nanometers. And here is actually obtained by SFG. This is a um, true interface. I mean, let's say less than one nanometer interfacial region, then relaxation time at the given temperature is gonna be extremely larger. What this means that from a change at strict surfaces cannot be relaxed, that one thing. So um, let me conclude my talk. Again, states and dense polymers in confined states such as surfaces interface. I skipped surface, but I, I just concentrate on looking at interfaces, and uh, they are sort of different from those in the bulk space, I mean, internal region. And from change that sort of interface cannot be fully relaxed at temperature being much higher than the bulk glassing temperature. And conformation of from change that sort of interface is strongly dependent on how the film is prepared. So this is very important. Once you prepare, uh, composite materials. If you apply different mixing methods, then conformation of polymers at filler is going to be drastically changed. Then final mechanical performance of composite materials would be different. What well, that is, we have to think about the second conclusion. And South Park, I skip this part, but I'm going to say and damage the polymer chains at the interface is strongly dependent on the size of energy of the substrate. So if you put some sort of surface treatment on film materials, in that case, interfacial structure of polymer chains and uh, damage of polymer chains at the interface will be a change. Then again, the final performance of competitive materials would be again changed. So uh, here's group photo and thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Tanaka for a very interesting talk. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, our audience to ask, if you want to ask, just raise your hand and then I'll give you opportunity uh, to ask directly to Professor Tanaka. But at the moment, we have uh, questions from two audience here. Firstly, from Dr. Darmawan, he has uh, three questions. Uh, what does from the surface can the sum frequency generation vibrational spectroscopy or FSG analyze? And then the second, in the okay. case, Let, 
let me let me answer one by one, or otherwise I will forget. Okay. <laughs> so. Um, Okay. Um, okay, let me give you just a number and less than one nanometer. Can you hear me? Yes. Better than one nanometer. Okay. So it's a very thin uh, yes. surface. Feature. Yes. If I have a time, I'm going to explain why this technique is so substantive, but we have more questions, right? So. Once I answer all the questions, then I can go back to the principle of SFG. Then it's clear for you to understand why this technique is so fast sensitive. Oh, okay. Okay, and then the second question is, uh, in the case of limited equipment, can the FSG uh, replaced by the FAR because of it access the same with number area? Yes. Mm. Actually, um, all right. This is also, uh, I have to explain the principle. So uh, let me answer this one at the end, right? Okay. And then the third is uh, how do you tune the measurements at different depths? Say again. Uh, next question, Paddy. So how do you tune? The measurements at different depths. How do you choose the measurements at different depths? Ah, all right. So, um, of course, you have to understand the principle of each measurement. Then each measurement has their own uh, depth resolutions, right? So, if we want to see very, very thin region, like a couple of nanometers, then we use, okay, this technique. And if we want to see 10 nanometers and so forth, we choose a different technique. And if you see like uh, a couple of hundred nanometers, then we choose a different technique and so forth. Then we uh, combine all the information to get the uh, mobility gradient, I mean, gradient of information along the depth direction. Okay, then you can uh, try to make a complete explanation. Yeah. Uh, what's the name? Uh, the main principle of the FSG analysis, and mm -hmm. then how it can be replaced or combined with FTIR because it uh, access access the same wave number area. All right. Um, can I can I share uh, my slide? Yes, please. Okay, let's see. Can you see my slide? Yes, we can see it. All right. So basically to get a signal, we have used two different excited beams. One of them is tunable IR, and another is visible beam. And visible beam, in this case, wave number was fixed to be 512 nanometers. But in case of IR, it's actually tuned from, um, let's say, See here, like, um, let's say, 1,500 nanometers up to uh, like 4,000 nanometers. Uh, I'm sorry, centimeter inverse. So um, that is the uh, limited number, I mean, web number um, for the measurement. So um, in that region, I mean, from 1,500 centimeter inverse up to around um, four, 4,000 centimeter inverse, we can replace FTIR, ATR, FTIR with SFG. Yeah. 
and what is next question the next question is uh, on the glass formation curve there is a dangerous area uh, for glass formation and then could you explain what does uh, the meaning of the dangerous zone for the glass formation curve i'm sorry i don't get the meaning of uh, dangerous zone what does it mean okay So it's okay. like in a solid state of chemistry, then when we speak about the uh, glass transition, then there is like called area dangerous zone. If you hear about it, Mr. Tanaka. All right, so glass transition is just a relaxation behavior. So um, if we see that earlier, um, At a different uh, time range, that number is going to be, of course, changed. But we've been working on polymers. So, in that case, we don't have, we don't think about a dangerous zone to damage glass transition and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I'm sorry, but I don't get the meaning of that question. So, oh, we can okay. discuss about it. Okay. 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 No problem, Professor Tanaka. Yes. And then for the next question from Naomi Siahaan, could you please? explain the random coils model related to the surface phenomenon okay of course in the bulk form chains should they have a random coil conformation but at the surface and at the interface form chains cannot take those conformations then actually form chains should they have like a pancake conformation pancake structure so called and uh, actually chains is pretty much uh, compressed along the D direction. In that case, of course, chain uh, must lose the conformational entropy. In that case, of course, some dynamics form a change at the surface and interface are uh, different from that in the bulk. So this is a very important question and a very good question. And then the next question is, what, what is the effect of molecular weight on polystyrene to the characteristic of the polystyrene at inorganic interface? And what the application uh, or use of uh, this information? Right, so let me answer to the second one. What the application user use? So we, of course, we think about just a composite materials. How do we understand the uh, meaning of uh, inorganic materials and so forth. So, uh, of course, our application is composite materials, composed of rubber and, uh, let's say, carbon blocks and uh, silicon, silica uh, particles and so forth. And of course, that knowledge can be used to, um, like, uh, some set legends with um, uh, carbon fibers and so forth. So those kind of composite materials, that's the application. And then what's the meaning of effect of molecular weight? It's really hard to answer because in the bulk, what we have to think about is the entanglement. Is that right? But at the substrate, I mean, solid interface, Anchoring points of polymers onto uh, a surface behaves like um, entanglement points. So in that case, molecular weight is actually, effect of molecular weight is strongly dependent on the situation. So it's a hard to answer. And uh, that is strongly dependent on the, um, the nature of uh, surfaces. Okay, and then the next question. Uh, what are the factors affecting uh, this different behavior of PS on different substrate? And do all polymers have similar tendency like what PS has? What does a factor do with different things? Um, actually, I couldn't mention, but the 
Another important factor is uh, surface roughness. And as I told you, uh, surface free energy and uh, how you prepared films. But I skipped the uh, surface roughness. That is huge impact. So um, then do all forms have similar things? Like, um, OK, um, in case of uh, how can vinyl polymers, probably yes. We have examined chromosome saturate and uh, SPR and polyacetylene and uh, NBR and uh, yes, probably vinyl polymers, they may have a uh, similar tendency. But in case of um, crystalline polymers, the situation is totally different because we have to think about uh, the effect of crystallization. So, um, could I answer to the second one? Uh, yes. And then the next one, uh, from the figure, so why when spin coating the polymer is not evenly distributed in the matrix? When one when spin coating polymer is not evenly. I, I'm sorry, I don't get this question. Uh, maybe Patty, you can ask directly, Patty. Uh, okay, okay. You mean in plane? Yeah, the the oh, oh, what is it? Because they're like like black 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 matrix, and you put yeah the like draw uh, like the polymer in the in the surface, and I saw that um, it doesn't uh, spread uh, distribute differently. Is it is it is it correct because because, because it collect it collect. Is that it, why because why is it not this this what happened? Actually, the substrate is rotated very fast, and uh, actually solution is homogeneous and uh, polymer chains are somehow entangled, so uh, it's pretty much homogeneous. But if we see the structure at the center and uh, at the edge. Then actually they have a slightly different structures. Okay. 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 Thank you. Yes. Yeah. The last. The last one. I think this is the last. The last question. Okay. Can be summarized that the interfacial relaxation is faster for the spin coated because of the centrifugal force. Interfacial relaxation is very, very slow, slower than that in the internal region. However, if we compare interfacial relaxation between films prepared by two different techniques, spin coating and uh, solution casting method, in that case, the answer is yes. I mean, the film for I mean by a spin coating method has the faster interface relaxation. Yes. Okay. Okay. Wow, a lot of questions, Professor Tanaka. Thank you very much for your uh, very nice uh, knowledge to us. And then now we are reaching to the end of this CKS webinar series. I would like to ask audience to give a big applause for Professor Tanaka. Thank you very much. So once again, thank you, Professor Tanaka, yes. for delivering a very interesting talk. And hope we have another chance to meet in another occasion. And it's also thank you for all audience for the questions and for your attention. And then hope we can see you in the next Jekaisa webinar series. And good morning. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tanaka. Thank you. Thank you, thank you.
Thank you, thank you. Live ya, Christian live ya Pak. Menyapa di private gitu loh. Tag private kan biasa. Hey, I'm not going to Uh -huh. <laughs> 